Amen. Welcome, everybody. Can somebody say something? Just so annoying. Make a noise. We didn't come to a funeral this morning. Make some noise. We didn't come to go to church either because we're not a church, by the way. But I see it. If you want to know what that is, I'll explain it to you later. The most important thing I believe that we need to do right now is hear from God. What is He actually saying? So we can speak for God and we can act for God. Yes. You know, Israel never enjoyed a victory without first hearing what God said and then being obedient. And every failure they had was a result of not listening to God and not obeying what he had to say. Amen? Amen. We're living in some interesting times, aren't we? I'm so glad you're here. I know some of you have, I invite you personally. We, we try to keep uh, this kind of limited to some degree. Uh, with all the craziness going on, I've been following Trevor for a long time, not in the physical, but online. Uh, when I watch his videos, I notice something. He drinks a lot of water. I drink a lot of water, too, so I loaded him up a little bit. We have plenty to drink from. So, anyway, Joshua chapter 5, Jesus appears in the promised land to Joshua, in a completely different form. He's now fully dressed in armor with his sword drawn. He's manifesting himself differently today than he did the last generation in the wilderness. And if we're not, we don't have eyes to see and ears to hear, we're going to miss that, that day of his appearance because he's manifesting differently. And Jesus is ready for battle. Are you ready for battle? Because we've got a nation to save. Yes. The body of Christ is in crises. If you haven't been paying attention to that either, because they're just following along with the world for the most part. Yeah. You got quiet on yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Dale, can you come up? I, I better stop myself because I will start preaching. Dale's just going to give us a we're, we're a congregation of prayer. We need to pray, but we also need to hear. Yes. You know, let me say something. Prayer changes nothing. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. That got quiet too. Prayer changes nothing. Effective prayer changes everything. James 5 says, The effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. What's an effective prayer? Praying in line with the Word of God, not praying our own desires, our own wishes and wants, what we like to. You know, a lot of people, I think, when Peter, when Jesus told Peter and the disciples that he was going to be crucified, he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to be. Arrested and be crucified. You know what most Christians would do? Just what Peter did. No, he would rebuke Jesus and begin praying that that doesn't happen. That, that was God's will. Yep. Right. That's why we need to hear. Because yep. some things are God's will. Yep. Amen. Hello. Yep. 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 Amen. Amen. Oh my. Oh, my. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Let's pray. <laughs> not a matter of coming into your presence, but allowing you to come into our presence. We open the gates, we open the doors, we open our hearts this morning to receive. To receive. I thank you that the anointing works in us and moves in us and is all around us. And sometimes we still think, wonder where that anointing's at. But this morning, we have eyes to see, ears to hear. I declare it so in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We bless your servants. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Well, let me introduce to you Trevor Loudon. He's from Christ Church, New Zealand. Right. Uh, you do live in Florida right now. Right? I do. Yeah. <laughs> He's a conservative activist. Amen. I want to add something. I, I just believe God sent you to America Amen. as a missionary Amen. to come here. To, to inform us and warn us of what's really happening. That's what I hear from you. Like, it's been your God's messenger to us. Yes. I am so thankful and grateful for you, for you and for your work in your ministry yes. and informing people. He yes. talks to a lot of different people. We're just blessed to have them yes. here, Amen. you know. And Amy Fox is the one that made that that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just really grateful uh, that he has. So, 
I just told him to be unleashed, share whatever he wants to share, and, and take as much time as he would like to. And I know he's going to take some uh, questions and answers at the, at the end, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So could you give him a, a warm welcome, Trevor Lyle. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, thanks to everybody for being here today. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. I understand the southern accent all right? <laughs> <laughs> I apologise to some of the people who heard me yesterday. You might hear the same jokes again, but uh, they're always good. Um, and I will start with one because I think it sets the tone. Uh, I was in any refugees from California here today. <laughs> um, I, was in, I was in Los Angeles a while back and uh, I love street food and I was buying some street food from a vendor and he said to me, um, you've got an accent, where are you from? I said, look, I'm from New Zealand. He said, well, where's that? <laughs> so to make it really easy for him, I said, look, it's down near Australia. He said, ah, the Arnold Schwarzenegger classroom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, look, look, people ask me, ask me why I, look, I've probably spoken to four or five hundred audiences around this great country, and people ask me, you know, why would I come from New Zealand to the United States? You know, what is it about America? And I say, well, there's a couple of things. The first is simple gratitude. You know, during World War II, my country was facing invasion by the Japanese army. They were brutal invaders. And all our guys were over in North Africa fight, fighting the Nazis. And if it hadn't been for the sacrifice of your uncles and grandfathers and fathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway, if they hadn't laid down their lives for us, we would have been done, folks. It's a very strong And uh, second thing is, Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. No freedom should ever fail in the United States if you ever lose your constitution, your liberty, your economic dynamism, and your military superiority. All of which took a huge trashing through the Obama years. Yeah, if that had continued, folks, we'd soon be living in a world run out of Moscow and Beijing and Havana and Tehran. Mm -hmm. And is that the kind of world you'd like to pass on to your children, folks? Yeah. You're pretty good in this country, sure. people, but the rest of the world doesn't. Right. And this is the light of liberty for the world, this country. It really is. Now, um, you know, Pastor Joe, I think, has got a great concept because a lot of people don't draw a distinction between church and ecclesia. You know, and church to many people is four walls, and you go and worship on Sunday, and what you do stays in those four walls, and that's pretty much it. That is the way many, many Christians see their lives. Ecclesia is much broader than that. You know, you're supposed to be spreading the word and, 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 and telling the truth in every area of life. Yeah. Every area of life. Why would it be boxed in? You know? Why? Well, the only reason is because your enemies want it to stay boxed in. They're happy if you stay in your church and shut your mouth every other time. They're really happy with that. Now, you know, if you, you know, to me, if you're commanded to love God and thy neighbor as thyself, which I think is pretty basic. Now, a lot of Christians will say, you know, I don't, I don't want to get involved in politics, you know, it's a dirty game, and, you know, we shouldn't be involved in that, you know, that's not for us. We're spiritual people. We don't want to get involved in that dirty stuff. Well, if you're, if you're commanded to love God and thy neighbor as thyself, do you have a responsibility to your next door neighbor? If you're a rich, your next door neighbor is starving, they can't feed their children, do you have a responsibility to help? Yes. yes. As a Christian. Yes. Yeah. So if this lovely town of Independence 
was being threatened by a tornado, or it was hit by a tornado, would you have a responsibility to try and rebuild the town, save people's lives, and you know, go out there and do what you could to help? Of course. Of course you would as a Christian. So if your if your nation is under threat, your nation is under threat, and that's going to affect the lives of every one of your neighbours, every one of your church members, every one of your your fellow citizens in your town, if it's going to bring down the greatest nation on earth, as a Christian, do you have a responsibility to help? Yes. yes. Of course you do. It's not politics, it's your civic responsibility. You know, and, and um, you know, we were given a sort of system of living, you know, we have families. You know, a family is a basic unit of our society. We were given that. Well, is that under attack right now? Yes. Yeah. From a whole bunch of ways. We were given civic government. You know, your government came out of Mosaic law. We were given a government. Is that under attack right yes. now? Yes. You know, is, is um, your, even your identity as a male or a female, yes. is that under attack right now? Yes. You know, the basic thing, if you don't know if you're male or female, what can you stand for? Yeah. What can you, how are you going to fight anything if you don't even know what you are? But even that's under attack for a lot of young people these days. You know, young people in the high schools be taught to transition. You know, they're doing this to eight-year-old kids out in California without parental permission. You know, the basic building blocks that we were given the, 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 the structure of society that we were given is under attack. And why is it worth preserving America? Because you know, we're told that America is this rotten, corrupt, racist society that got rich by ripping off the third world. That's what a lot of our young people think these days. Well, what, what, what is great about America? See, for thousands of years, this is how it worked. You had kings and rulers on your, over your society, and they talked to God, right? And God told them, this is what has to happen. And they would tell you, this is what God tells me you must do. You must go and fight those bad people over there. You must give me 20% of your wheat that you harvest every year. You must um, worship as I say, because this is what God tells me. They call it the divine right of kings. And it just so happened that usually what God wanted was exactly the same as what the king wanted. And it just sort of happened to work that way. And so basically the world was run by, by kings who spoke for God and you, if you disobeyed your king, you were defying God. That's how it worked. Now, we all regard that as, as crazy and, and insane, but that's how much of the world still runs people. You know, you're very different here. So what happened? Why did you have a revolution in this country? You had a, It wasn't about stamp taxes or tea duties or, you know, taxes. What, what happened really was you had 13 colonies here. And they were settled by people from Europe who fled religious persecution. And every one of those colonies was run by a different denomination. Like Pennsylvania was a Quaker colony, Maryland was Catholic. They all were run by different denominations and they're all settled by people who couldn't abide the state religions of Europe. Where if you grew up in a certain country, you had to follow a certain way of, of you know, a certain denomination. And if you didn't, you could risk death. So they came here to escape that. So they could live by their own conscience and worship as they saw fit. And when they saw King George coming after the colonies and trying to exert his will and trying to take away their liberties, they knew that everything they'd sailed thousands of miles to get away from was coming back. And they were not going to have it. Right. That's why they fought the revolution, folks. So they could practice their faith as they saw fit. And that revolution 
was led by the black robed regiments. Yeah. The pastors with a Bible in one hand and a long rifle in the other. Yes. And they would lead their, their flocks after their Sunday service. They would cast off their robes, bring out the gun and say, who's coming with me to fight the British? And the whole, all the men would, would follow out and the women would make the food for them and you know help them out. And that's what won the revolution. And that was a lot of blood, people. That was a lot of sacrifice. But look what it gave you. That's right. The greatest country the world has ever seen. The country that has done more to spread the gospel around the world than any other. The, gospel, the country that's built more churches and hospitals than any other. That has saved more nations from tyranny than any other. Including my own. You think God wants that lost? Seriously? The greatest country the world has ever seen. And it's now at risk. And you've got millions of Christians in this country who say, I can't be bothered. Politics is not for me. I'm not even going to vote. You know, that's, that's, that's a dirty game. Well, of course it's a dirty game when the good people aren't involved. What's it going to be, folks? No, no, because you, you, you create a vacuum, yeah. vacuum, something's going to fill it. And so the, the, the radical left has made it their business to keep Christians out of the civic affairs of their nation. And one of the biggest steps was back in 1955 when a man called LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was then a senator from Texas, later became a president, got this brilliant idea to keep Christians out of politics because they were so pesky and they stopped people doing what they wanted to do, these, you know, politicians. They were just, you know, they stood on principle and that was annoying for politicians. Yeah. So you've got this brilliant idea. We'll change the tax code with the Johnson Amendment. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is tell every pastor they can have a tax-free church, but they can't endorse candidates or talk about political issues in their churches. And every cowardly pastor in the country said, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I no longer have to talk about the tough stuff. I no longer have to talk about the real issues. I can shut my mouth and rake in the money, and everybody's happy, and the politics politicians can have their stuff, and we'll have our little church. We'll abandon Ecclesia, and we'll have our church. And a few years after that, they took prayer out of schools. And a few years after that, they passed Roe v. Wade, legalizing abortion in this country. Do you think they could have done those two latter things if they hadn't neutralized the churches first? That was a plan, people. Yeah. Get the Christians out of politics because they're too pesky and they stop us doing what we want to do. And a whole bunch of pastors brought right into it. And they still follow that philosophy today. They've abandoned Ecclesia, they're in their church, and they don't want to poke their nose outside that church for love nor money. That's where we are today. The church has abandoned the leadership of this nation. The churches that gave you the greatest country the world has ever known are now not even willing to protect it. Not even willing to save it for the future generations. Now how, how can you sit in a nice church, say out in Iowa, and you've got a very comfortable lifestyle, you've got a couple of cars, you can take a holiday every year, You've got a really comfortable life, you've got a nice church, nice people, and the country is going to hell in a handbasket around you. And you think you have absolutely no responsibility for that state of affairs. Your neighbours are suffering, your country's suffering, it could lead into total chaos, and you're sitting in your comfortable little church, never poking your head out the door, never voicing your opinion, never offering moral leadership, never taking a stand, and you call yourself a Christian. How does that work, folks? You live in the greatest country the world has ever known, with more wealth and freedom than anybody has enjoyed, 
but you have zero responsibility for taking your leadership position to maintain it. How does that work? Do you think I'm being a little bit harsh, folks? Just give you another example, you know, where things can go. You know, we all know about the Nazis, right? Nazi Germany. You know, the horrible things they did, the, the millions they slaughtered. Well, when Hitler was coming to power, there was one force in Germany that could have stopped him. And that was the German churches. They had the numbers and the moral authority to stop that tyrant in his tracks. And what did they do? They sat in their church. They became Nazi churches. They put swastikas in their churches. You have the country, Mr. Hitler. We'll have our church. You do your stuff. We'll do ours. That was the deal. And what did that lead to, people? 20 million dead in World War II. 6 million Jews. Hundreds of thousands of your uncles and grandfathers and fathers picked up rifles and went to Europe to sort the mess out that the German Christians had left them. You know, when, the, when these people are held accountable, folks, is it a little bit harsh to say that the blood of World War II is really on the heads of the German Christians who did nothing? Is it a little bit harsh? Or is it true? It's true. Or well, we're in a situation today, right now, folks, we are facing tyranny in this nation. Right. Right now. You know, we've got a gentleman here who's lived through a civil war instigated by the Muslims and the communists in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Brought devastation to his land. You know, there are, I know a lot of Lebanese people had to flee because the country was in slaughter for years. Because the communists and the evil people just laid it waste. And you know people all over the world that come to America because they're fleeing tyranny and destruction in their own nations. Well, if America falls, where do they go, folks? There ain't nowhere left. I'm a coward, people. If there was somewhere safer, I'd be there. <laughs> there really would. But this is the last stand. This is the last stand. Now, you know, um, Donald Trump, and, and just by the way, does anybody think there might be a touch of the miraculous on the 2016 election? Oh. <laughs> I think even our atheist friends would, would acknowledge that one. Now, it wasn't supposed to happen, was it? It was Hillary was going to win, right? Hillary was going to win. It was all over. But it didn't happen that way. But to me, exactly, that was the, the hand of God was on that election. And we were given a second chance to save this country. But if you look at the Old Testament, there was a lot of times the Israelites got a second chance. Okay? But how many times did they get a third chance? If they ignored that second chance, did they get a third chance? Well, we are on our second chance. And people say, well, you know, you're exaggerating a bit. You know, things are a bit rough out there right now. There's a bit of violence, but, you know, we're, we're going to carry on. Well, I just want you to think and do a little bit of math. And I did math before Common Core, so I know how to count. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to do percentages and stuff like that. Now, so right now, there are about six, there are, according to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there are 22 million illegal immigrants in this country right now. Now, a lot of these people are just good, God-fearing people who fled Mexico or El Salvador or Guatemala to just have a better life for their kids. I, I, I can understand that. They broke the law coming here, but I understand why they did it. But here's the thing. Hillary Clinton promised to give all of those people citizenship and, and voting rights within 100 days of taking office if she was elected. Now, if they were all given citizenship, citizenship and voting rights, what proportion of them do you think would vote Democrat? Probably 90%, 95%. Okay, so that would give the Democrats 15, 16, 17 million new voters overnight. Okay, am I roughly right on that? Yeah. So Mitt Romney 
won his election, uh, lost his election in 20, uh, 2012 yeah, by, by about two and a half million votes. Donald Trump won by about 300,000 votes thanks to the wisdom of your founding fathers and the Electoral College, but actually lost the, uh, the uh, popular vote by nearly 3 million. What do you think will happen after the next election if the Democrats win and they get 15 or 16 million new voters within the first 100 days? You will lose Florida, you will lose Texas, you will lose Arizona and Georgia and North Carolina. There will never be another Republican president in this country ever, or any conservative. You will only have socialists. Now you might be a Democrat. Your daddy might have been a Democrat. You know, with the Harry Truman, everybody knows Harry Truman in this town. Well, if Harry Truman was president today, I probably wouldn't be worried. Because Democrats were different then. Yes. Democrats are communists now, people. Yeah, they That's right. That is reality. Not a pleasant one, but it's true. If we lose the next election, they will legalize 15, 16, 18, 20 million new Democrat voters. That's it. There is no comeback from that. The numbers are overwhelming. In 2016, November, the November 2016 election, you were that close to losing this country permanently. But God smiled, people, and we elected a president who actually cares about the country. Yes. And that's our second chance. And we better use it, folks. We better use it. See, what was supposed to happen? See, I thought, you know, Donald Trump Jr. said the 20... Uh, a while back, he said the 2016 election would be communism versus freedom. He said that on Fox and Friends, and the Fox and Friends host said, Are you kidding? You, know, you, you mean sort of liberalism, don't you? Or progressivism, or whatever. He said, No, communism. And he was 100% right. See, what has happened, you know, back in the 1960s, you had all these hippies, you had all these anti Vietnam War protesters. And they supported the communist Viet Cong. They supported Fidel Castro in Cuba. They supported the Nicaraguan Sandinistas. They supported every tyrant around the globe. Well, those people that were in their 20s then are in their 60s and 70s now. They are running the media. They are running the unions. They are running Hollywood. They are running the universities. And they are especially running the Democratic Party. And those people want their revolution before they die. And they've got one more shot at it. One more shot with this election, legalize every illegal immigrant in the country, open up the doors to Muslim refugee resettlement from the Middle East, and swamp you forever. That is their plan. Because this is the horrible thing, you see. The left, the radical left, has taken over virtually every institution of our society. But the one thing they didn't have was the churches. And these pesky Christians would do things like vote for Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. And they couldn't have that. How could this happen? We've got the universities, we're teaching the kids about socialism and LGBTQ and... and um, environmentalism and all this Marxist stuff and they're leading in our way, the kids are all right, you know, and we've got the Hollywood, it's pumping out endless amounts of socialist propaganda, we've got the media, we've got the unions, we've got all, all of us, but these pesky Christians don't get the message. They believe in the Bible. <laughs> no, they don't believe in socialism. We've got to educate them or change them somehow. Because they're holding up the plan. And just, I'll digress a little bit. You know, I talked before about the structures we've been given, right? Mm -hmm. We've been given families, we've been given businesses, we've been given nation states. And if we follow these rules of life, things turn out pretty good most of the time. You know, we're fallen beings, we always make mistakes, but we have basic structures to stick to. Marriage, family, all that, it works well. So what is revolution? 
Revolution is the overturning of the natural structures of life. Setting parents against children. Setting wives against husbands. Setting employees against employers. You know, making nature more important than man. You know, um, you know, you know, the environment is more important than you are. You know, over to you know, abortion, promoting abortion, promoting homosexuality. All of this kind of stuff is designed to overthrow the natural structures we have been given. Right. Yeah. That's revolution. That's right. And you know, what did Lenin do? He wanted to abolish the family. He wanted to abolish religion. Because this, he, he hated God. The ultimate revolution is to turn man against God. It's right. to overthrow God in heaven. So all of this revolutionary activity we are seeing now is basically designed to overturn the natural structures we have been given, overturn our government, overturn our families, overturning the way we live to institute a new society that worships man and ultimately Satan rather than God. That's really what it's about in, in, in its essence. And when we see in the turmoil we see in our country right now, that's all it's ultimately designed to do. So we, you know, when you're in the church, when you're in the ecclesia, you should be the main enemies of this. Amen. You should be the bastion against this Amen. revolutionary activity. Amen. You're on God's side, not the devil's side. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Now when you're in a church, and as, look, I've got a friend with... Turner Moon enemies with the church. He goes to what he thought was a, a good Baptist church in in, um, in, uh, in Iowa. And the other Sunday, they were out there giving pizzas to the local Black Lives Matter protesters. These people are communist folks. Uh -huh. and the church is going out supporting these people right. and taking a knee to these people. No, so this is the kind of thing. When the church is aiding the enemy of God. You know you've got a problem. Yeah. When they think by supporting these communist revolutionaries they're doing something good, you know the church has lost its way. It really has. And you should be so grateful you're a church with someone like Pastor Joe Amen. who actually talks about the Ecclesia and doesn't try and get you all locked up inside your church. And shutting your mouth every other, you know, every other time in your life. This is different here, people. Yes, if every ch if every church in America was an ecclesia, we'd have a very different country. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. hugely different country. So that puts a lot of responsibility on people like you, folks. Yes, it is. Now you got to be leaders in your community. You got to be spreading the word as much as you possibly can, and standing strong and supporting each other. Because we're heading for tumultuous times. Yeah. Now, so what is happening in America right now? Well, see, these 60s revolutionaries, they, are, they run most of America now. And the plan was, we elect Hillary Clinton, um, we legalize all the illegals, we take control of Texas and Arizona and North Carolina, the Republican Party becomes a small little party in Wyoming and Montana, and, the, and South Dakota, but it has no power. And then we start implementing our socialist programs through the schools. We start closing down businesses we don't like, and we work with the left-wing churches to shut out the conservative churches yeah. and shut them down permanently. See, one of the plans was they passed the Equality Act through the last Congress. Yeah. So what does the Equality Act do? And that will become law if the Democrats are, are elected, right? The Equality Act says you cannot in any way discriminate, discriminate against LGBTQ people. Yep. That sounds all right. Yeah, okay, that sounds fair enough. But what that means is if a gay couple come to this church and say, we want to get married here, and Pastor Joe says, well, that's really not in accordance with our beliefs. You should go somewhere else. You'll get slapped with a $5 million lawsuit from the Department of Justice for discrimination. Yeah. Yep. What's that going to do to your church, folks? Your ecclesia. 
it's going to shut you down, is it not? So you either have to become left-wing Christians and worship, you know, the LGBTQ agenda and get all fired up about global warming and get all fired up about critical race theory and all this. If you do that, you'll be accepted, you can survive. But if you actually want to stand on the beliefs that you come here for, you're done. You're out of it. You're closed down. Does anybody think I'm exaggerating? No, that's exactly the plan they have. Because it's people like you who stand in the way of their agenda. It's crazy people like you who do things like electing God and And they do not want you gathering. They do not want you having any influence. You've got to be shut down. And they will shut you down if they get power in this country. I'm not here to frighten you people, I'm just here to tell you what's going to happen. Because this is the plan. This is what they tend to... You've seen the thuggery out in the streets that are happening right now. Yes. You've seen, you know, did you imagine this would ever happen in your country? No. I've been coming around America for 10 years now telling them, you are going to have communist revolutionary activity on your streets in the next few years. And people would go, Oh, that's very interesting. You know, like <laughs> like 40 years, 50 years, 60 years in the future. I would say no, for the next four or five years. Because this was planned for election year, folks. Yes. This was absolutely planned. Yes. Yes. Now, we look at, we give you an example of Black Lives Matter, okay? But we all know that the riots started because um, George Floyd was killed by police in Minneapolis. That was the cause of it, right? No. Yeah. Not even close. Yeah. This was planned for three years. Yeah. This was all organized by a pro-Chinese communist group called the Freedom Row Socialist Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, based out of Minneapolis, but they had branches all over the country. And they tried to start the riots um, with a killing, uh, when a killing happened in Kentucky. They tried to start it with the jogging case in in Georgia, where a, a so-called jogger was shot by a couple of guys in Georgia. He wasn't a jogger, he was burgling houses, yep. right? But anyway, they tried to start it, but it didn't sort of fire. It took a while to get things going. But they were going to do it no matter what. If it wasn't that guy in, Georgia, in Minneapolis, it would have been Fred Smith in Kansas the next week, or Joe Jones in Seattle a week after. It was just the spark they needed. You know, the leader of that group, the day that President Trump was inaugurated, January 20th, 2017, she stood up in front of a big crowd in Washington, D.C. and said, our job is to make this country ungovernable, to bring down Trump. Openly stated that. And they have done it. They set up an organization in... Um, in what was it in November 2019 called the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, an anti-police, anti-racism group, branches all over the country, and they were the group that sparked the riots in Minneapolis and spread it all over the country. Deliberate operation by pro-Chinese communists to destroy this president. They had a system, they had a, a, a the rest of the riots were started by another group, and you might have heard of them. Um, well, no, you wouldn't have heard of them. You've heard of their front group. It's a group called Liberation Row. It's another pro-Chinese communist group, and their front group is Black Lives Matter. Now, Black Lives Matter was started by three young women, Patrice Killers, April Tometi, and Alicia Garza. And they were just three chicks who were sitting around and they were all worried about Trayvon Martin who got killed by a security guard in Florida. And they were really concerned that young black kids were being deliberately hunted down by police. So they just came up with this hashtag as you know, Black Lives Matter and sort of took off, right? Yeah. Absolute garbage. They are three hardcore, fully trained communists who came up with this idea and it was spread all over the country by Liberation Road, the pro-Chinese communist group. And now you've got churches buying into it, folks. It was a deliberate operation right from the start. Their trial run was Ferguson, Missouri, not far from here, right? 
That was run by a woman called Jamala Rogers of the Organization for Black Struggle. Mm -hmm. And that is a front for Liberation Road. And they brought 10,000 people from out of state to trash that town. They burned all the black businesses down because you can't have blacks being successful, right? Because that destroys the narrative. Yeah. That all blacks are oppressed and they've got to be poor and they've got to vote Democrat. And if they start getting rich and making money, they might start getting politically conservative. So they burn their businesses down. That was a complete communist Chinese operation. And look what it did to that district. I've been through there, it's still burned out. You know, there was a big sign on one of the buildings, went through there. It was a picture of a machine gun with kill racist America. And the America was KKK in the middle. America, K, K. You know, a complete communist operation. And it's still having an impact in the state. Look, in that we're doing a movie, Enemies Within the Church, and one of our scenes is, is a, an evangelical Christian convention in Missouri in 2015. And just after Ferguson, and these are all young white kids mainly, because this is the Midwest, and their guest speaker is a woman called Michelle Higgins. And she's an evangelical Christian pastor from St. Louis. And she gets up and tells these kids the thing that God wants them to do more than anything else is to end white privilege. Okay? So white privilege is apparently, ending white privilege is apparently the 11th commandment that somehow got missed off. Okay? So these one young white kids all fired up. Yeah, we got to, Jesus wants us to end white privilege. We've got to end white privilege. Most of these kids are probably on food stamps. But they've got to end white privilege. And this is going all through the churches. Crew, Campus Crusade for Christ, all bought into this garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle Higgins, they didn't tell them this, Michelle Higgins was a member of the Organization for Black Struggle. Yeah. And ACORN, remember ACORN? Yeah. Right? She is a Maoist. She's a communist. But she's teaching these young kids that their mission in life is basically to promote the Maoist line. And they think it's Christianity. This is happening all over, folks. You can go to thousands of churches across this Sunday, country every Sunday, and you'll hear lots about global warming, or welcoming refugees, or ending white privilege, or social justice, and hear very little about how or sin or redemption. Right. Think of right. exaggerating yeah. that? People? No, no, you're not. That is the state of the churches today. They are being brought to Marxism because people like Jim Wallace and the Gospel Coalition, Tim Keller, and some of the big mega churches have adopted the left wing line right. and they're spreading it through the seminaries. They have been heavily infiltrated and now the young pastors are coming out all fired up for this stuff. Give me an example. And a friend of mine is a, it was in North Carolina. He went through um, Southern Baptist, Southeastern Baptist Seminary there, which he said is almost a fascist-like atmosphere now. He was told, he put a blog post on his blog, very mild. He was told if he did that again, he would never graduate from that institution because it was against the narrative. But anyway, there was a church there with a new pastor and um, he, the pastor noticed, he came out of the Southeastern Baptist, the pastor noticed there was two families in the church, one black and one white, and they both had the same surname. So therefore, logically, the, obviously the ancestors of the white family must have once enslaved the ancestors of the black family. This is his supposition. So he demanded that the white family apologize to the black family for their sin of racism. Wow. And the white family said, Are you kidding? We've never owned slaves. Nothing to do with us. Besides, we're Christians. We're responsible for our sins, not the supposed right. sins of somebody a hundred years ago. But the pastor insisted, he was all fired up with critical race theory and white privilege and whatever, all fired up, he demanded they apologize. And it got into a fight. 
and that church dissolved. That church no longer exists now. Okay. Which is probably good, yeah, but, but it didn't have to happen, did it? No. You know, because you have all these young pastors now fired up for socialism, thinking they're promoting Christianity. And you know, whether you're, you know, you, you look at you look at the country, you know. Andrew Breitbart used to say, he was a very pro prominent conservative journalist, and he always used to say, politics is downstream from culture. You know, the politics of your nation is shaped by the culture of your nation. If your culture is corrupt, what are your politics going to be? But what he should have said and could have added, yes, politics is shaped by culture, but your culture is shaped by your religion. That's right. Yes. Your religion shapes yes. your culture, your culture shapes your politics. Yeah. So if your politics is screwed up and corrupt, what is that telling you about your churches, no, right. your religion? Yes. Yeah. Right. Because your churches, your, your churches have become churches, not ecclesia, right. and they are, have got out of the culture and abandoned the culture to the godless and the communists yes. and whoever wants to take it, which is then destroying your politics. And if you don't think that's going to influence your futures, people, you have never read a history book. There you go. This is going to have a huge impact on all of your futures, economically, politically, uh, culturally, yes. crime, your property values, everything. And most of all, your religious liberties. <clears throat> because, you know, to these people, you know, Bible-believing Christians are the enemy. Because they're the only ones who will stand up against this new agenda, yeah. this new socialist religion that has been planned for, for this world. So do you think, you know, you can sit, you know, this, these people think they can sit in their church and they can shut their mouths and write this out. You think they're not going to come after you when they get power to shut you down? You know, over in Cuba, you know, they have underground churches. You know, they hide away and they read the Bible and they, you know, they keep things going. They used to do that in communist Romania and in communist Russia. They would hide away and they would read the Bible and they'd make sure nobody knew what they were doing because that could cost them their job or get them sent to jail. But okay, that was then. And those countries don't have heat-seeking devices and computerization and, the, and the, the surveillance technology they have in this country. You think you're going to hide away in your little church you know, with the technology they have today? You think they're not going to know what you're doing? You know, people used to say to me, uh, when, I was, when I used to talk about communism in New Zealand, and I grew up in a, a semi-communist country, people would say, oh, what are you talking about? Communism is so bad. You know, people would just rise up and throw it off, right? I'm just, you know, and I would say, well, listen to me, you know, you're in a room, you're at say the church here. There's 50 people in this room, and there are five informers for the Communist Party. But you don't know who they are. What are you going to do? How are you going to plan anything when there are five, one in ten people in this room is working for the authorities and they can inform on you and they can send you to jail. They can get your kids taken off you by the state. Are you going to oppose the government in any way? After the East German Berlin Wall fell down, they, they went through the stars and files, the secret police files. They reckon one in seven East Germans was spying for the authorities. Wow. Husbands were spying on wives. Children were spying on parents. You've got to understand what tyranny means, folks. So I think there's a lot of Midwestern Christians who think tyranny means they have to give up one of their three cars. <laughs> and... Um, and that they may not be able to go to so many holidays in the Caribbean. That's what they think tribulation means. That's what they think tyranny means. You just take a holiday in Venezuela for a week to see what it's like down there. You can't buy toilet paper. You can't buy where you get two chickens a month for your family. 
where there's 10,000, there were 10 million Venezuelans um, 10 years ago, now there are 6 million, because 4 of them, 4 million of them are now living in America or Colombia or Brazil, because they're starving. The richest country in Latin America in 10 years was reduced to abject poverty by socialism. Well, you know, they, they, these, these people that run the Democratic Party now, they don't want to make you like France or Germany, folks. They want to make you like Venezuela. That's what they want. Because they want complete power. You know, people say to me, well, what is the motivation of communists, you know? What, what you know, they've seen it wreck countries everywhere. They've seen it's never worked anywhere. They've seen it's failed everywhere. Why are they still doing it? Well, the dumb ones, the, the low, low ones, they think, yeah, it's going to work, and the only reason it hasn't worked everywhere else because America destroyed it. America sabotaged it. America drove the Soviet Union into bankruptcy. America has embargoed Cuba, made them starve. America is doing the same for Venezuela. So to have communism, we've got to destroy America. So that's the dumb ones. But the real smart ones, they know. They know a bit different. They know that communism works great because communism is not about distributing the wealth so everybody gets a share and we all live peacefully and happily ever after. Communism is about concentrating all wealth and all power in a very few hands. That's what it's about. It works great. Kim Jong Un is pretty rich. He's got old, he's got Porsches, he's got Swedish mistresses, he's got everything he wants. But the people starve. But it's been a successful system for him. Yeah. And this is what they want. You know, you think, what is ultimately what's about? This is, you know, there's a great poem, Paradise Lost by Milton. You know, and he explains why did Satan leave heaven? Why, why did Satan, at the, at the side of God, want to go and leave, leave heaven to go to hell? Because he was so egotistical. He would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And that's the motivation of these people. They're so egotistical. They just want power. They just want to run things. Everybody who's ever been to high school knows that there are some people who just love bossing other people around, right? <laughs> there is always bullies. Well, communism elevates those bullies to give them complete power. Mostly in our society, they get shunned, they go away, and they work the rest of their life at McDonald's or something. They never get power. But communism gives the bullies power, and they gravitate to that system. So you get the worst of society running society. And that is what we are heading towards, folks, unless we rediscover our roots. Yeah. You know, we, house, that's yeah, right. that we rediscover what we, uh, our inheritance, yes. you yes. know, the first country in the world where your rights came from God, not the state. Amen. 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 You know, that was the revolution, that was a real revolution. As I said before, it was all divine right of kings. The king spoke to God and he told you what to do. Well, the American Revolution said, no, that's wrong. God speaks to you, he gives you. You, your rights, That's right. yeah. Yeah. your freedom of speech, your yeah. freedom of religion, your freedom of conscience, that's yeah. from God. And the only purpose of government is to protect those rights. Yeah. 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 With the Constitution, with elected representatives. You know, so we've got to rediscover those roots. You've got to understand this country is founded out of the Bible, folks. Yeah. 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 That's what made you great. It wasn't that you had lots of timber and gold and you could make lots of money. It was because you had the certainty of the rule of law and the freedom of speech and a second amendment to protect your freedom of speech. That gave you the confidence and the certainty to go out and build churches, create great businesses, oh, sorry. <laughs> great, sorry, create great businesses, you know, create a great culture and build what you have today. You know, whether you're religious or not, you owe everything. 
You're at every great thing you have in America to the biblical values that this country was founded on. That's true. That is the root of America. Yes. And most Americans have forgotten those roots. Yeah. And if you've forgotten your roots and what gave you the great things you have, you're up to be ripped off. You're up to be scammed out of what you have. And most Americans now, many Americans, could easily, in the next election, vote away their own freedom. Just do it. They, they could easily do it. Uh -huh. so, yeah, my apologies. Thank you very much. And so, you know, as, as they say, you can vote your way into socialism, but you have to shoot your way out. That's right. It doesn't, what's the bad guys? You know, you invite the mafia into your town to build some businesses, right? And you decide you don't like the mafia anymore. So go away, mafia. Go away. Are they going to go away? No. They've got your town, they're going to keep it. Same with socialists. Once they have power, they never give it up unless you force them out. And that's bloody and it's vicious and brutal. And I don't ever want to see that happen on American soil because I never want to see them get the opportunity to take the power that they crave. Does anybody want to you know, have a civil war in their own country? You know, you saw it, the last civil war was pretty bad, right? That was brutal, that was horrible. But that was Christian gentlemen fighting Christian gentlemen. You know, they, they might have been fighting a bloody war, but they, they were Bible believers and they treated people with respect. They didn't shoot prisoners. They didn't, you know, commit atrocities. They committed some, but not on a wide scale. Well, you imagine what the next civil war would be like. You think the people have the same morality out there today? It would be more like my friend experienced the Lebanon or something like that, where there were atrocities on a regular basis, you know? Or something that you know happens in Nigeria today, you know, where Muslims come into towns and just slaughter everybody, men, women, children, doesn't matter. Mm. You know, that didn't happen in your first civil war, but it would happen in the next one. So the, my message is basically this. You know, we had to occupy till he comes, are we not? Yes. Right, that's right. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of verses in the Bible about, say, a son inherits a farm. And the son is expected to maintain that farm and look after that farm and make it grow and flourish, is it not? Mm -hmm. Well, you've inherited this country, greatest country the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. You think maybe it's our responsibility to grow that country and make it flourish and, and, and to keep prospering and, and, and keep building it? Yes, is that yes. probably what's expected of us? Yes. Well, there are certain things we have to do to make that happen, don't we? You know, a farmer doesn't just leave his farm and it just grows all by itself. You've got to get out and fix the fences. You've got to husband the stock properly. You've got to rotate the crops. There's a whole bunch of things you've got to do to make that farm flourish. Well, there's a whole bunch of things we've got to do in this country to make this country flourish. Right. And sitting in your church and ignoring everything that goes on around you isn't on the list. That's right. That's right. It is being involved in your community. It's been taking an interest in the politics. You know, getting rid of bad people and getting good people into public office. Right. Now, is that not part of the responsibility of living in a free country? Yes. 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 So when certain pastors tell you we should be keeping out of politics, we should be ignoring that, are they speaking out of a true, are they speaking telling you a true Christian message? No. no. <laughs> they are being sucked in by Satan people. They're telling you you should give the leadership of your nation up to evil. That's what they're telling you to do. Am I wrong on that? No. You know, that's what they're telling you to do. And they're, they're going to keep telling you because it makes you comfortable, makes their life easy, and the left-wing politicians think that's just great because that means we can do whatever we want and when we've finally got complete power, we can just go squash those Christians anyway. 
You know, that's what we do. You know, every communist revolution has, has persecuted the churches. Everyone. And now they have the tools to do it far more effectively than they ever have in the past. Far more effectively. So, if I thought there was no hope for this amazing country, I'd be back in New Zealand right now building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. <laughs> we cannot determine, you know, when this world is going to finish. We cannot determine when this country is going to finish. It's our duty to carry on as long as we have brains, as long as we have hands, as long as we have mouths, yeah. as long as we have muscles to do what we need to do. We got to keep on going on. Now you imagine. Now maybe you want well, something a bit more positive now. You know, <laughs> you, you imagine President Trump wins the next election, right? And the taxes keep coming down, and your religious liberties are more restored, and. You know, we're energy independent now. That's a great thing, yeah, folks. Yeah, yeah. That means you don't have to rely on your enemies for your fuel. Yeah. Right? That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, and the border wall will be built. Yeah. Not to keep, not because I hate illegal immigrants, it's because I value the security of this country. Yeah. Now, how many times did the Israelites have to build a wall around their city? Yeah. You know, to protect them from invaders. And what happened when they didn't? Yeah. The whole Old Testament is full of national security issues, folks. <laughs> you know, you've got to be up yes. to If you cannot secure your home, or your town, or your nation, what do you actually have? That's right. You know, what, what, what do you have? You know, you don't open your door to anybody. You know, you welcome guests, but you don't like burglars. There's a difference between a guest and a burglar, and there's a difference between a legal immigrant and an illegal immigrant. Yeah. Right. Yes. Very, very different. Yes. You no, know, so you imagine, you imagine, so the border wall gets built, so there's not an unending supply of illegal immigrants for the for the greedy businessmen to exploit, you know, for their cheap labour. And so, has anybody, did anybody notice the difference between the Obama economy and the Trump economy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay. Absolutely. Well, when Trump got elected, the checkbooks came open. Because a whole bunch of businesses who wanted to expand were not going to do it when Obama was running things. Okay? Right. So Trump got in, more business friendly, let's build a new factory. Let's open a new plant. Let's employ some more people. Within a couple of years, black unemployment was the lowest it had ever been in history. Yeah. Latino unemployment was way down. Virtually anybody who wanted a job could get one, right? Right. It's the best we've had it for a long time. And people were looking good. Okay? So, so we get, we're getting that built up. But now, right now, a lot of businesses are sitting on their checkbooks. Because they're thinking Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, ugh. Do I really want to put $10 million into this new plant when they're going to raise taxes, Green New Deal, all this kind of stuff? So they're sitting on their checkbooks. And employment stood up with the COVID and that employment's not too good right now. Or well, Trump gets re-elected. The checkbooks will come out, folks. They'll come out like you haven't seen before. Not just from America. They'll come out from all over the world. People wanting to invest in American industry. So you're an American worker. You're not competing with illegal foreign labor. There are factories being built and plants being built all over the place. You're going to be sitting really, really pretty. Your wages are going to go up and up and up and up. And all those Bernie bros who sit in their mom's basement are going to move out and get jobs and get mortgages and get married and have kids. They're going to forget about it, this socialism garbage. You know, we can do things. We can abolish the Department of Education. Yes. 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 You know, so that you can educate your kids in Missouri values, not socialist Washington values. Yes. So you don't have transgender education in your schools. You might even have Bible study in your schools. Yes. Yes. 
You know, you could do a whole bunch of things. Get America out of the United Nations. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. We can move towards that. Make America even greater again. Yeah. All of this is open to us. But if we lose, we're in trouble. Yeah. If we win, we can start a virtuous cycle that may go on for decades or hundreds of years. Yeah. Right. And you can build more churches. You can spread the word all over the planet. You can put the dictators of the world on the back foot. You can have a very different world if we win. Now, and here's another thing. You know, your religious liberties have been under attack for a long time. Yes. Yes. And your Second Amendment rights have been under attack for decades. Yep. But we sort of thought our First Amendment rights were okay with that. Now, we've still got our freedom of speech, right? Well, even that's under attack now. Yeah. Right? Yes. Big time. Well, President Trump has done more to put conservative judges in the courts of your nation than any other president has done by a country mile. Yeah, that's right. And that is already having an impact on your religious liberties. That's having an impact on your Second Amendment rights. That's having a lot of positive impacts around the country. And it's just started, right? This is going to have impacts in years to come. For the Supreme Court, for 60 years, the radical left has owned the Supreme Court. And they make an unconstitutional decision, they call that precedent, and you've got to abide by it, then they make another unconstitutional decision on top of that. So they have restricted so many of your rights completely illegally. Yeah. But we're living with it. Well, now, thanks to President Trump, the left does not control the Supreme Court. We have technically a 5-4 majority. Though Roberts is a flake and goes one way one week, goes the other way the next. But the left doesn't control it like they did. And Roberts does vote our way more often, you know, more often than he doesn't. But okay, think about this. Now, I don't wish anybody well. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg is getting pretty old, folks. Mm -hmm. She's one of the supreme left-wing Supreme Court justices. She's in her 80s. She just had liver cancer. Her health is not great. President Trump gets re-elected. Do you think she's going to be there four more years? No. no. Four more years? She has publicly said, folks, she would love to leave the Supreme Court and go and retire and live in New Zealand. Okay? Right down in New Zealand. I'm willing to take one for the team, folks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Come down to New Zealand, you can play bingo all day long, <laughs> and you will have a 6 3 majority on the Supreme Court. <laughs> maybe 7 2 by the end of the term, and yeah. Trump sets it up for the next time, maybe 8 3. Yeah, I know, 8 1. 8 1, I'm right back. Instead of that, my common core maths, maybe. Uh, <laughs> did you know that eight out of five Americans are enumerate? Oh, yeah. Eight out of five. Think about it. <laughs> 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 Think about it. You don't need to. But anyway, so, so look, there's a lot of potential for positive here. That's what I'm saying. Yay. Um, the downside is pretty horrific. But the upside is pretty great. Yes, amen. So the point I'm trying to get to you people is this. We're here every election they say, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. <laughs> well, this one actually is. Yes. yes. Because this country is either going to go straight down in three months' time, or it's going to start spiraling upwards. Yes. yes. One or the other. And that may come down to a few votes in one district in one state. Yeah. Trump needs the House back, yeah. so you obviously got to keep this in here, yeah. and, he, and, and get any others, like get rid of Sharice Davids, you know, over, yeah. over the road. Yeah. And um, you've got to get the Senate, you know, make sure he gets an increased majority in the Senate, mm -hmm. so um, he doesn't have to put up with Mitt Romney and, you know, Susan yeah. Collins and that sort of thing. You imagine Trump with the House back, an increased majority in the Senate and the White House. Oh, yeah. He would yeah. be unleashed, Peter. Yeah. yeah. 
Don't you think he wants to stick it to the left a little bit? <laughs> yes. You know, imagine what he would do with that mandate. Imagine the great things you could achieve for this country. Amen. For your religious liberties. Yeah. For your gun rights. Yeah. For your freedom of speech. For your businesses. For your education system. Yeah. All of these things would move in a positive direction. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's right. Amen. Imagine what we could achieve for this great country. And imagine what that would do for the rest of the world. Don't you think the Iranians want to be free? Don't you think the Lebanese want to be free? Don't you think the South Africans want to be free? And the Brazilians and the French and the Australians? Well, if America goes down, folks, we lose it everywhere. Everywhere. But if America survives and restores its constitution, if there's a spiritual revival in this country, that will spread across the globe, folks. The dictators will be on the back foot. You know, you could see a free China. You could see a free Russia. You could see, you know, a free Iran. You could see a whole bunch of changes that we can only vaguely imagine right now. You think I'm getting a little bit carried away, folks? But it's all there for the taking, but we've got to do our bit. You know, just think, you know, and I'm not going to go on too much longer, but just think, you know, back in the Revolutionary War, your ancestors had squirrel rifles, yeah. and they were blacksmiths and farmers, and they went up against the world's biggest and most powerful professional army. Were they insane or what? <laughs> They went up against the world's greatest military machine with what they used to shoot squirrels and turkeys with. And they, they fought for year after year. They lost almost every battle. They were, they'd go away from their farms for months at a time. They'd come back and sometimes they'd find a burned out farmhouse and some fresh graves. But they were fighting year after year after year, losing and losing and losing. Dodging British bullets, walking through the snow with no boots, eating berries to survive. And then in a year after year, for this crazy idea of a new society where their rights came from God, something that nobody had ever done before, and they kept on at it, and they were losing and losing and losing. They were almost done. I was in Morristown, New Jersey a few years ago, in the encampment where your troops spent the winter of 1780. And that was a little ice age, folks. That was cold. And 10,000 troops started that winter. Death, desertion, and disease took 4,000 of them. The officers were eating their pet dogs to survive. The troops were eating their boots. They stole every chicken in the, in the, in the, for miles around. The farmers hated them. They stole all their livestock just to survive. They were paid nothing, and they came out of that almost on the point of surrender. And George Washington got down on his knees and prayed at Valley Forge, folks, on the point of defeat, the point where it was all over. And he got up, and he went on to take the British out in the surprise attacks at Yorktown, turned the course of the war. To the course of war, but not just the war, the course of world history. Yeah. Amen. You imagine this world without America in it for the last 200 years, people. Yeah. You imagine what a bleak, dark, horrible place it would have been. You know, how many times have bullets whizzed past George Washington's head? He had bullet holes in his jacket. Multiple, multiple times. Marvel, they survived. Why did he survive? Because I think God wanted him to. Yeah. But George Washington didn't win that war all by himself, did he? And President Trump's not going to save America all by himself. Yeah. But we need leaders. And but we need the soldiers too. We need the people willing to stand up. I can't promise you what's going to happen in the next few months, folks. You know, I can only, I can, but I can promise you two things. If we do nothing, you risk your children living in slavery. 
You really do. But if you give up everything you've got, everything that's within you over the next few months and beyond, actually put that principle of Ecclesia into real practice. You put that principle into practice, two things may happen. One, you could do everything that's within you for your God and your country and your family. And maybe we still lose. Maybe that's a possibility. We have to think of that. But at least you will all earn the right to look your children in the eye and say, say I did everything I possibly Amen. did for you. Right. Right. Everything. Mm. And if we win, and we absolutely can win this, folks, yeah. is that Amen. 2016 election convinced me that God is not finished with this country. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If we win this, we will spark an economic boom like you've never seen. We will spark a liberty boom like you've never seen and the potential for a spiritual revival like you've never seen. Amen. All of those things are possible. Are they worth a little bit of sacrifice, people? Yes. Are they worth an extra check, an extra bit of door knocking, an extra bit of phone banking, talking to more of your friends, dragging your family members to the polls? When President Trump wins on election night, will you regret any of it? No. Will you regret any of the effort you put in? Because it will give the country a renewed hope, folks. And it will put the radical left on the back foot for years. Keep them out of that here for a very long time. So I just want to say, my only value to you is as an outside observer. Because sometimes you sort of see your neighbor's situation a bit more clearly than they see it themselves, right? Yeah. You know, we all know what our neighbors should be doing, maybe not what we should be doing, <laughs> but we all know how they should be living their lives. <laughs> so I'm coming to you as an outside observer, someone who loves this country from afar, so to speak, and just imploring you to look at the opportunities that are in front of you and do your best to achieve them. You know, you all have the power to make a difference. And this is the most critical time in America's history since the Civil War and the end of the War of Independence. And I'm not calling you to walk trudge through the snow. I'm not calling you to take up arms. I'm calling on you to take your civic responsibilities as seriously as you possibly can. To take your leadership role in the community as seriously as you can and take that principle of Ecclesia as seriously as you can. Yeah. Is that too much to ask? No. no. So I want to say to you folks, thank you so much for the stand you take, for the beliefs you live, and for the friendship you've given to my country, and for what you do for your own country. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here today. Oh, right. We have plenty of time. You got three bottles of water left? So yeah. Yeah. Of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand thing in mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions. I've also got some books and DVDs out the back. Um, you know, if you're in a war, you've got to know, the first thing is you've got to know you're in one. Right. The second one, the second you've got to know your enemy. So, please look at the books and DVDs. I'll sign the books for you. But, you know, I think they will help arm you for the, for the times ahead. They will let you know, you know, just the enemy we're facing and what we can do to combat them. So, Absolutely. I just want to make a quick comment on the enemies within. I've watched it two or three different times. Uh, that came out about four years ago, five years ago? Yeah, this was the 2016 election. Yeah, we sold them here too. Excellent. Matter of fact, right as COVID started, I watched it again. It's amazing some of the things we already talked about. 
leading up to this. Yeah, well, so I don't know what prophetic in a way. It was a bit out there at the time, but now it's... it's Amen. Look, look I, got a, I got an email from a woman the other day. She said, we were sitting at home. Somebody gave us this DVD. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I watched your DVD halfway through. My, my boyfriend and I decided we're going to change our registration. Yes, ma'am. This this week, Kamala Harris, um, she got the bid for VP. Yeah. She got the bid for VP. They're calling her a moderate. And I think you might have some insights into that that we can clean. Okay. Oh, the deal will look quick with Kamala. Now, Kamala Harris has been portrayed, she's a moderate Democrat, right? <laughs> Her voting record is to the left of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Amen. Yeah. She was the, the most... Yeah, she was regarded as that she had the most left-wing voting record in the whole Senate last year. That's saying something. That's worse than Bernie, worse than Elizabeth Warren. But this is Kamala Harris. Her parents... Her mother was this, the daughter of Indian revolutionaries. Her father was a Jamaican Marxist economics professor. Yeah. Open Marxist. He was recruited to Stanford University in 1975 as an affirmative action Marxist because they didn't have enough Marxists on the faculty, so they recruited him to bring up the ballots. Okay. Her parents were both members of the Afro-American Association, a Maoist communist group that promoted Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, all this kind of thing. Two members of that group left, Huey Newton and um, Bobby Seale left that little group and they set up the Black Panther Party, a pro-Chinese communist radical terrorist group. The Black Panther Party is the model of the Black Lives Matter movement yeah. of today. Yeah. Okay, Kamala Harris went to uh, Howard University where she was a radical. She went to San Francisco where she um, got into politics and, and got into the law. And her boyfriend was the 60-year-old Willie, Je uh, Willie Brown, the mayor of San Francisco. She was 30. He gave her a couple of... Uh, do no work, get paid lots of money jobs, which got her elevated, and she got elected um, Attorney General of uh, District Attorney of San Francisco, then Attorney General of California, then Cal U.S. Senator. Willie Brown was a Communist Party supporter his entire life. He was elected with the help of the Communist Party. He was still supporting Communist Party causes even after his affair with Kamala invited the head of the South African Communist Party's terrorist wing, Chris Harney, to San Francisco and honored him there, and now he's Communist China's best friend in the Bay Area. Kamala Harris was then picked up by a man called Steve Phillips. He was the man who got her elected, gave her all the money, um, was her political mentor. Steve Phillips was a member of the League of Revolutionary Struggle at Stanford University, a Maoist communist group. He is the man, then he left uh, Stanford, he married into the Sandler family. They had Golden West savings and loan. They sold it to Wachovia Bank, got $2.2 billion profit. Uh, it was full of subprime mortgages. That bankrupted Wachovia, who had to sell out to Wells Fargo. But anyway, they got their 2.2 billion, they put it into the Democratic Party and the Progressive Socialist Movement. They, um, Steve Phillips, used that money to buy himself access to the leadership of the Democratic Party. He was the man who got $10 million together um, and did, in 2008, did voter registration drives in 17 southern states which, was got, which got his good friend, Barack Obama, ahead of Hillary Clinton. And so Barack Obama owes his career to this Maoist. Mm -hmm. And so then he picked up, um, he ran George, he, he picked up um, Stacey Abrams, who almost won the governorship of Georgia, she's a communist. Uh, Andrew Gillen, who almost won the governorship of Florida, another communist. And Cory Booker, who became the senator from New Jersey, another communist, and Kamala Harris. 
He is the mentor to Kamala Harris. So Kamala Harris owes her entire career to pro-Chinese communists. You know, Donald Trump, Donald Trump said that if Joe Biden selected Kamala, uh, Joe Biden will sell the country to China. Well, he picked the perfect VP to help him do that. She is a hardcore communist, and she's been sold as a moderate Democrat. But Joe Biden is a hardcore communist, also being sold as a moderate Democrat. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering about what you think about Trump advocating the vaccine. Yeah, that's that's a mistake. You know, look, he look about ten percent of what Trump does, I vehemently disagree with. About ninety percent of what he does, I I wholeheartedly support. You know, he's in that mindset, that that generation that thinks vaccines are a great thing. And he wants to end the epidemic, so he'll probably promote a vaccine. I'm I'm not a vax guy, you know. And um, I, you know, there are plenty of things around that can cure COVID without vaccines. And you know, when you got Bill Gates and all these people promoting, Bill Gates who loves communist China like a chocolate, That's you right. just keep away from it. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm we, we, we got to, we got to stop. We got to, we got to put us. We got to say we don't want that stuff. We don't have to agree with everything Trump says at all. You know, you don't look. I, I guarantee there's no married couple of here who agrees with anything <laughs> what they, which each other says. It doesn't mean you get divorced, does it? No. Um, you know, so, you know, I support him. I'm not even seeing what he does. I don't support that, and I would publicly stand against that. Absolutely. Um, gentleman down the back. I think you're a gentleman, sir. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. I can see your face now. <laughs> Where do you read in God's Word about the United States and the end time prophecy? Yeah, but I, I am not a scholar enough to comment on that. You know, like I, I regard the United States as a special country anointed by God. I don't know when the end times are going to come, sir. I don't know if it's next week. Or a thousand years. I, I'm not as enough of a scholar on that to, to make any real determination or give any opinion. Um, all I know is we're told to occupy till he comes. Yeah. 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 To be working yeah. all the way. Um, look, a lot of people have prophesied the end of the world for a long time, and it's yeah. never yeah. it never come. Mm -hmm. And look, even when it does, it doesn't mean you stop mowing your lawns. I mean, even if it's imminent, you don't stop mowing your lawns or or paying your mortgage to you. Right. Yeah, no, you know, we just gotta keep doing the stuff we gotta do yeah. until it's taken out of our hands and we don't get to decide when that is. So uh, I'm sorry I can't say more on that, I, I just don't know. I'll let you call on people and I'll take well, there's a gentleman right behind you that's very keen to um, say something. Yeah, I was just curious, you know, what is Australian and also uh, New, uh, New Zealand like for for the government? Because I, but I hear very little about it. And then I remember years ago that 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 Australia, you know, they don't want no no Muslims whatsoever. But but those two countries, you know, I heard very very little. Yeah. But, but if Joe Biden wins, you know, I might have to move over yeah, there yeah. let me live with the mates. Look, look, um, I, I, when Obama was in power, I could have started up a, a, a travel agency with all the Americans who wanted to go out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a question. So, look, Australia and New Zealand. Um, we were both, the Australians were settled by the Irish convicts, uh, the convicts and the Irish. They are, they are a bit more rebellious. New Zealanders were settled by the English gentry, the second sons of the English gentry. And the unionists, the trade union guys who fled Britain. We've had socialism since I was, before I was born. I grew up in a country where you had free this, free that, free this, free that. And but you paid sixty percent tax, where you couldn't import stuff. Where they used to call us the Albania of the South Pacific. But I grew up as a little New Zealand communist. I believed in all this stuff. I thought this was how it should be, 
And I thought Americans were horrible people who let people starve in the gutters. You know, that's that's the kind of thing we were taught. No. Um, New Zealand now has a Marxist Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. She was the head of the World Socialist Youth in 2011. She's a Marxist. And she has got us locked down over there like you wouldn't believe. You, they have compulsory detention centres now for people who have COVID. You've got to go and get locked up until they clear you. You know, New Zealand is a wonderful country. You, you have a great holiday there. But the politics are horrible. Australia is a little bit better. They have a Christian evangelical prime minister, and he's good. But they have some states that are controlled by the left, like Melbourne, like Victoria, is like California. Yeah. And they have got the rule locked down there too. And you know, you've got no gun rights in either in either in either um, place. They're all very secular. Uh, New Zealand and Australia are like Sweden or Norway. Nobody goes to church, hardly. Um, very secular country, very socialist. You have no gun rights whatsoever. Um, you know, um, I, I don't want to run down my own country because it is a wonderful place and the people are wonderful. But if you, you do not have anything like the freedoms there that you have here. Right. And the only reason they're not absolute tyrannies is that they're small populations. Right. And, and, you know, if they were big populations with the same laws, we would be tyrannies. We would be horrible places to live. And look, and here's the thing. You can go and flee to New Zealand. If America goes down, China would have us in a heartbeat. If, about three years ago, four years ago, the Australian Minister of Defence, and just so you know, Australia is a little island off our west coast, right? <laughs> but the Australian Minister of Defence was in China for talks, and a top Chinese general publicly said to him, Australia needs a godfather, someone to look after you. The question is, will it be an American godfather or a Chinese godfather? Mm -hmm. If you are smart, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. How do you think that made us feel? When Obama was gutting the 7th fleet at the time and China was building its navy up like crazy. We all know in America, in New Zealand, if, New Ze if America goes down, we are Chinese from that point onwards. And they will not be pleasant colonizers, I can tell you that. Jeremy, up the back. Yeah. Um, I thought for a while, and it's kind of been, been uh, rumored around a little bit now at this point, uh, of Joe Biden not even actually being the nominee. I felt for a long time that that actually Clinton would get in there and they would be replacing him. There's a lot of talk on it now, and especially since she got out of actually, I don't know if you heard Yesterday, I guess she won the appeal where she don't even have to testify on all the email scandal and the ben, Benghazi and stuff like that. Do you actually feel that Joe Biden, that can't really complete his sentence very well and don't know where he is or what he's running for, do you actually think he will be the Democratic nominee come to come election time? Probably not, but, but see, Joe is the real Bernie in the race, you know, like weekend at Bernie's, you know, just the body that gets. It was always going to be Kamala Harris. I was saying three years ago that the candidate would be Kamala Harris. And I bet a whole bunch of state dinners on that. And then I had to pay out when she lost it, when she bowed out of the race. But I want to go back and get them now because she is actually the <laughs> She actually is because she was always planned. Yeah. What they wanted was a female yep. of colour. Yeah. Because it's all about the minorities. Yeah. Okay? And this is the Obama strategy. You get the progressive whites plus the can plus the minorities and you gotta run a candidate of colour. Yeah. And they muck they, they wrecked it by running Hillary Clinton. She won't get another chance. Yeah. But Joe will either bow out before the convention or after the convention if he goes through right through to the election. She will be the candidate anyway. 
We all remember in 2008, Sarah Palin was the real candidate, not, not John McCain, right? Everybody loves Sarah, and nobody really liked John McCain that much. And if he'd let her run, if he'd let Sarah off the leash, he would have actually won that election. So Kamala is the actual candidate. Joe is redundant now. He could bow up tomorrow and nobody would even notice. She would be the candidate. She would get another vice presidential, you know, she, she'd pick a vice presidential candidate and keep running. So whether Joe buys out, bows out next week or after the convention or even after he's elected, he is now redundant. Kamala is the candidate. Can I get a follow-up? Yeah. Sure. Do you feel that... Uh, do you feel that justice is going to be served very well? Everything that's happened, all the corruption of Obama Gate, Spygate? Well, I, 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 I really wish it was, but I don't think so. I think we'll see a few lower level ones go to jail and most of them will walk free. That's what I think. If Trump gets re elected, I think then we will see some of the higher level ones go to jail. Because he'll have nothing to lose then. He won't have another election to face. And I'm sure he would love to do it. You know, I'm not being uncharitable here, but does anybody, would anybody be happy to see Hillary Clinton in an orange jumpsuit? <laughs> <laughs> because it's not, it's not, a, it's not a cool thing. It's just the justice is important. We're not America. You know, justice must just... We know she's going to face justice one day, yes. but she's got to face justice here too. Amen. Because it's not that just justice must be done; it must be seen to be done. Yes. It restores confidence in the system. Yes. Yes. You know, the bad guys go loose all the time. Yeah. We all think, well, well, I might as well get my piece too. You know, I might as well just. If they can get away with corruption, why shouldn't I? There you go. And that spreads all through society, you yeah, know, and just makes the whole society more corrupt if the leaders can walk free all the time. Yeah. She has done things. If you were in the army, and you were a sergeant in the army, and you were as lax with security as she was, yeah. you'd be in jail. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be in jail, but she walks free. And that gnaws at every decent American. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. disgusting. Yeah. But I'm not stupid enough to think it's going to happen before the election. But maybe some of them will go to jail after the election. Maybe if we get them elected. You know, I'd like to see the whole lot of them. Amen. Yes. But I'd mean, have to build another Leavenworth. You know, <laughs> you know. But so I'm a little bit of a cynic, but I am an optimist at some times too. You know. But yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. Allen, is that how you pronounce your name? Trevor. We're very thankful to have you here. A lot of thankful to be here. Uh, I've got about nine questions and I know I'm not going to get to ask them all, so I'm going to maybe go with uh, one of my top three here. Uh, something that, uh, by the way, everything you've spoken, must, you're confirming what? It's been in my spirit, God has been speaking to me for a while. And, uh, you know, various, coming in, in various ways, and in, even in dreams and things. But anyway, uh, what do you think about our justice system and its leader, current leader, William Barr? William Barr, yeah. Okay, well... See, I think the biggest mistake that Trump made when he came into office was not cleaning out there you go. the That's Justice right. Department, all the, head, the, the heads of the FBI, CIA, because Obama, who was a communist, and 90% of Americans still don't realize that, unfortunately, right. he was a communist, um, he put a whole bunch of people in all of those institutions. Yeah. And so Trump comes in, being a businessman, he thinks, well, I give an order, they do what I tell them. That's how it works in business, right? Or it should work in business. Well, the government doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> and there's a lot of inertia, but see, he had it even worse. It wasn't just that they were slow or slack. They were openly resisting him and covertly resisting him. And he, I don't think he realized the depth of what he would face. So he, he put a lot of people in for a start that he shouldn't have put in. And he's got Barham now, and 
But I've got a very good friend, Cliff Kincaid, who was actually born in St. Louis, Missouri. He runs Accuracy in Media, and he's done a lot of work on Barr, and he's not a fan because of the things that Barr did during the Clinton era, covered up, helped to cover up white water and things like that. So Barr's done some good things, but I don't have the faith in him that a lot of other conservatives do, unfortunately. Um, the jury's out, but I am not overly enthused, to put it that way. Yeah, one more. Thank you so much. Yeah, this, uh, you know, I, I think we all realize we have a lot of mixture in our government, um, unfortunately. Um, my question is, Walmart's just gave a huge sum of money. Who, who did that? Walmart. Oh, yeah. oh, that's according to what I've heard. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you choose what you choose to believe, you know, as we all do. But anyway, saying that's true, give the benefit of the doubt, say they gave the hundred million or whatever. Uh, my definition of fascism, I'm not going to give. I want your definition. Your yeah, definition of fascism. See, um, the old. It's a form of Marxism, but it, it's it's communism is traditionally where the state owns all business and all means of production and just tells everybody what to do. Fascism is where you have some private business, but the state tells you what to do. Where, where big government and big business work together, and it basically small business gets squeezed out, and so you just have the big corporate state. That was, that, that was, that was Benito Mussolini's dream. Big unions, big business, big government. Yeah. Little guy, forget the little guy. You know, I, I, and see this is why I never use the word capitalism when I describe the American system. That's a Marxist term. And most people, you know, most young people when you talk about capitalism, they think of big business, they think of Google ripping off their privacy, they think of, you know, massive business, um, multinational intruding on everybody. That's really more corporate fascism. You know, I talk about the American free enterprise system. Mom and dad businesses, family farms, small factories, whatever. That's really what America was built on. You know? But when government gets too big, business makes a deal with government. And business, big business gets bigger as government gets bigger, but small business gets squeezed out. So I don't believe in big business and big government working together. I believe in small government and lots of small businesses. Yes. Right? So everybody's got a farm, everybody's got a business, everybody's got a, a burger bar or a, or a beauty salon or whatever. That's what I believe in. They employ people locally. That's the American dream to yeah. me. Yeah. But when, when business gets really, when government gets too big, big business decides we can make a deal with government. We can get special licensing and regulations, and we can make it so tough for little business to compete that we'll have a monopoly. Mm -hmm. So fascism is really uh, 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 an alliance between big business and big government. Yeah, and that's what you get. We're, we're moving towards that in America yeah. because the government's got so big yeah. that little business finds it hard yeah. to compete and only big business survives. So I sort of agree in some ways with Bernie Sanders. You know, he identifies the problem right, his solution is even more government, mm. yeah. which will make the problem even worse. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the solution is reduce the size of government so all businesses compete on an even playing field and you get bigger if you provide a better service or a better product. Right. Right. That's yeah. the only way. That's, That's right. to me yeah. the answer. Yep. That's right. Yes, sir. Do you have a website where you can upload these facts or tools? Well, I, I, I have a daily blog, trivialout.com. You know, trivial, my name, .com, and I have a lot of articles on that. Uh, I have a lot of um, YouTube videos online of, of various of my speeches, and I also have a website called KeyWiki, K-E-Y, key like turning a lock, wiki, 
and that's got 130,000 files on it, of all the communists in your state, all the radicals, all the presidential candidates, all the bad guys. Um, you know, you've got in this area, you've got your Democratic Socialists of America, you've got Communist Party USA, you've got Socialist Party USA, Liberation Row, all operating in your state. The Communist Party runs St. Louis. Yeah. Actually yeah. runs yeah. St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Now, Democratic Socialist America works very heavily in Kansas City with the Democrats. Liberation Road runs Colum and is very heavy in Columbia uh, and, um, and St. Louis as well, Ferguson area. You've got a lot of commies in the state, so you can identify who they are by going to KiWiki. And, uh, but my daily blog has a lot of articles, but if you want to, the best things to, to the, you know, get my views and my books and my DVDs, really. Yeah, they're just out the back there. I've got a few left out there. So that will be one more question, because I know people have got things to do, and, you know, they've got to go feed the cows and whatever. <laughs> so, yes. We'll take this one. This, you, you, yes, yes. Yep. I was just wondering what your reception is, or what is your typical group like? I wonder about young people. I have teenagers, and it seems in talking with them, they're fairly uh, just kind of blasé in many yeah. ways. Young people seem very blasé and just kind of want to go about their life. Yeah, well, you know, look, look um, when we were young, I know I didn't listen to my parents, you know, and, and this is, here's, a, here's a, something to remember. If you want to talk to your children, don't talk to your children. Get your grand, get the grandparents to talk to the children. <laughs> you know, because you know why? Why do grandparents have a special bond with grandchildren? Because they have a common enemy. We got we got to reach the young. Absolutely, we got to reach the young people. Right? Yes. The young people are, very, and some people, some, in some ways, this generation now is actually more conservative than were the generations before. They're very concerned about their privacy. They're very concerned about the, the growth of the big state and that kind of thing. Many of them are sympathetic to socialists, they don't know what it is. But look, they, they agree with Bernie that there's a lot of rigged system. Big business works with government. And people get beaten down. They agree with that, and they get sucked into believing more government's the solution rather than less. But they they know there's big problems. Now a lot of young people say, you know, they say a lot of young people favour socialism. You know, fifty percent, sixty percent. But when you re rephrase the question, I've seen surveys like this. Do you support socialism? Oh yeah. Do you support a system? where the bulk of your wealth is taken away from you and given to people who don't work for it. <laughs> goes down to 12%. <laughs> yes. yeah. Look, it's all of the messaging. Right. The young people go through school and they're indoctrinated, indoctrinated, yes. indoctrinated. That's why I think the best thing we can do for our kids is abolish the Department of Education and bring education back yeah. to the yeah. level yeah. so yeah. parents can control yeah. Yeah. You know? So you know what your kids are learning. You can control what your kids are learning. So they're not told their whole lives that America is a rotten, corrupt country that ripped off the third world, that the founding fathers were all horrible slave owners. They actually understand that this is the best country the world has ever seen, that has freed more people, brought more people into prosperity, done more to spread the gospel than any other. And it's a country to be immensely proud of. Yeah, that's right. But they're not getting that message. So, but I, you know, I, I go to, I, I speak to a few young audiences. I'd like to speak to more. And if you can get get past the, the you've got to know the terminology and, and, and the language kids speak. And, and look, they love liberty as much as we do, folks. They really do. They want a great future, they want families, they want businesses, they want to express their views, they want to have freedom of speech, they all want that. They just aren't told 
the guiding principles to get it. Mm-hmm. And they're actually told the principles that will take it away. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so we are a great, we really have to get control of the education system. We have to use our grandparents and our elders to talk to our grandchildren to tell them what America is really about. You know, because, you know, kids might not like listen to mum and dad, but they will listen to grandpa. Yes. They will, you know, grandpa took them out bass fishing. You know, grandma took them to the county fair, you know. They have a bond there. And yes. grandma and granddad have the time. That's why the family is so important. Grandma and granddad have the time and the history to impart those values onto their children and to their grandchildren. Because, you know, we're making money. We're paying mortgages, you know. And um, when there's always this natural thing. You don't listen to your mum and dad. You know? <laughs> so we, we've got to use that advice. We've got to use our grandparents more to instill these values. You know, because they, they have the knowledge. They know what America used to be and can be again. Yeah. And they love, they love their grandchildren. They love their grandchildren. And they want to pass on to them the amazing country that they inherited. So, you know, I, I just think, you know, the young, the young people love liberty as much as we do. Yeah. But we owe it to us, we owe it to them to give them the country that can give it to them. Yeah. You know, if we let this country slip away from us, we're going to find it very hard to look our grandchildren in the face and say, sorry, sorry, look, you know, I had a great life, I was rich, you know, I had a great business, I was free. I'm sorry about what you have to hear. No, none of us wants to do that, do we? We want to pass on to our children and grandchildren something even better than we got. Something even greater. You know, my daughter's 15, my son's 17. You know, that's what motivates me every day. Every day. They can do what they like to me. I'm 62 years old, I've had a good life. But I want to pass it on to them. That's my duty. That's what keeps me up every night and keeps me going every day. That's the thing. So thank you so much, people. I really enjoyed talking to you all. I hope there's something that come from this. I learn every time I speak. And look, you've got a great country, you've got a country to win and a great future to build. Just please do everything you can to make it happen. You'll never regret fighting for freedom, folks. That's right. You might regret letting it slip away. You'll never regret fighting for it. And you meet the best people in the struggle, the people who love their country, who love God, who are willing to fight for it. Those are the friends you want to make, people. Amen. So thank you very much. Please come and sit me at the table, but it's great talking to you. You know, you know what I'm impressed with so much is how much knowledge it has. Look how looking at notes, and he's just rattling all of this stuff off. Hey, can you come back next Sunday? To <laughs> uh, and then maybe the next one after that. Yeah, I bet, I bet she knows.